Dr. Arlen, Arlen Andrews, Sr. is currently manager of the Advanced Manufacturing Initiatives Department at Scandia National Laboratories in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He's a member of the American Society for Mechanical Engineers and was chosen in 1991 as the first ASME Technology Administration Fellow and in that capacity served 10 months in the Technology Administration of the U.S. Department of Commerce. I believe you also wrote an article or, or a story in analog about that experience. <laughs> Working on issues of critical technologies, space commercialization, nanotechnology, international competitiveness, and the problems with small and medium manufacturers. In 1992, he was selected as the ASME White House Fellow and served 14 months in both the Bush and Clinton administrations in the Executive Office of the President, Office of Tech Science and Technology Policy. In 1993, he was promoted to his present position at Scandia and now interfaces with external customers in industry, universities, federal and state governments, and with internal Scandia organizations that possess advanced manufacturing capabilities and facilities. Dr. Andrews has published extensively on future technologies, including SSTOs, space travel, nanotechnology, virtual reality, which we'll be hearing about today, solid freeform fabrication, and intelligent manufacturing. Please welcome Dr. Andrews. When I sent that thing in, I didn't know they were going to publish and read the whole bar. It was supposed to be just selected samples from that. Uh, I saw part of Bob Zubrin's uh, Bars Direct program earlier. Uh, it's too bad we both had to follow Mike Mullane's talk. My God, that was so inspirational. I just wanted to get a drink and talk about it the rest of the night. But um, the dreams that you've seen presented here in the last couple of days, Delta Clipper, uh, Mars Direct, uh, Jeff Bynes is going to talk about the Space Cub later. For a lot of those my age, we're not going to be able to realize those uh, probably while we're still alive uh, in the physical form. So, uh, but in virtual reality space, we might be able to realize those dreams. Uh, someday I do want to relive Apollo 11 landing. We want to simulate that in virtual space with a complete simulation ride in our words. You might wonder why a national laboratory is talking about virtual reality. So let me tell you, we invited to talk in three parts. Stick around at least for the third part, because that's the part you're going to like. We have a projection television system. We're going to show you VR applications to engineering and scientific visualization. We're going to take a VR tour of the solar system. We're going to show you a way to hold the entire solar system in your hands. And then if we have time and we don't run over, we will show some pictures of the scientific visualization experiments we're done at Sandia to show the uh, shoemaker levy impact on Jupiter. Uh, the tapes I'm going to show you have probably been seen by 12 or 15 people because I just picked them up about uh, Wednesday, Thursday afternoon before I left. Let's see if I can. Speaking of high technology, how do you turn this thing on? Oh, fantastic. Let's see, this cord only goes so far. Standing in some people's way here. Well, no matter where I'm standing, I'm going to block some people, but we'll hurry up through this part of it and we'll get to the video at the end, which is the fun part. Uh, for old science fiction fans, they might recognize the title up there, at least the first part. One of my favorite old shows. They should read virtual reality impacts the physical realm. I don't know where this would came from, but anyhow. Impact usually means a, uh, no, means by definition, a collision, uh, exchange of momentum, loss of energy, and things scattered. And believe me, you know, when we start talking about virtual reality impacting the physical realm and society, we're going to have an own analogies to that. What do I mean by virtual reality? Uh, you can go down to an arcade and you can see games that say that they're virtual reality, you see things on television are supposed to be VR. If you go back to the definition of a virtual image in optics, as opposed to a real image, a real image is one that you can uh, focus through a microscope or micro magnifying glass and burn ants with. A real image shows up on your film. A virtual image, like a mirror image or others like that, you can't touch, except maybe your fingertips when you look at yourself in the mirror. So a virtual reality is an oxymoron that uh, the scientists I know really despise. They prefer to call it synthetic environment. A computer-generated environment that makes you feel as if you're in another place. 
The phenomenon was first noticed that I read about in the early 70s at Bell Labs when they were trying to do teleconferencing by putting a helmet on your head in one room with uh, loudspeakers over your ears and TV uh, images in front of your eyes. In another room, in a teleconferencing system, there would be an automaton, with two microphones, two video cameras, linked to your head. So if you turn your head to listen to somebody, the robot would turn its head and vice versa. So it's going to be a teleconferencing system. The first person to try it out thought, my God, I felt like I was there. It wasn't like I'm sitting here looking at this stuff. They said, I'm in the other room. I've been teleporting. And I came across it because there was a tech, uh, tech memo written by Lambs called uh, Teleportation. And when that appeared, title, when that title appeared in the index, I had to order that to see what I'm really talking about, teleportation. That's the kind of VR I'm talking about, and not something on the screen that you know you're watching, but something you're totally immersed in. Okay, how do we get from Sandia Labs to that? Let me tell you. Sandia Labs is uh, managed and operated by the same people that Bob Zubrick works for, Lockheed Martin, Lockmark Company. We are owned by the Department of Energy and we build atomic bombs, or at least they used to before I got there. Now they build a lot of parts. This is your basic off-the-shelf B-83 hydrogen bomb. You can dial up the megatonnage of it if you wish and uh, take out various things. I was surprised by that. I always thought if you're going to blast the Russian, just blast the whole place, but no, you can dial in what you want. The part that I want to talk about is not this. This right here is the pit. This is where these other lesser known laboratories like Los Alamos and Livermore, Lawrence Livermore built, thing they call a, a pit. The other thousands and thousands of parts are built by Sandia or designed by us or specified by us. In fact, except for the first two, Fat Man and Little Boy, all nuclear weapons ever developed in the U.S. were designed, tested, not the fire part of it. Designed and tested by Sandia. In fact, our people were involved in all the nuclear tests when they used to do those underground, above ground. So the DOE manufactured a lot of parts. But we do it for a lot of applications, not just bombs, since we don't build bombs anymore. We do it for applied energy systems, for solar and wind energy, microelectronics, robotics, Component engineering we do for ourselves and other defense agencies. Environmental robots, uh, cleanup systems. We also do secure transportation. It was a shock to me five years ago when I got to San Diego to realize that nuclear weapons have been transported in semis all over the country. So when you pass one on the highway, you never know quite what's in there. So be nice to truckers. You would not want to know what happens if you try to get inside one of these. Even though uh, Lex Lothar did it in Superman, I think, once. Because the DOE and Sandia and all of us build a lot of parts to maintain the stockpile that's out there, because we had to come up with uh, new materials, new processes, and we have to keep some of these very secret because we don't want some people to know how to build some parts. We do a lot of it internally. But like uh, NASA, like NASA and everyone else, we're facing right-sizing, downsizing, layoffs, and all that sort of thing. The budgets are going down, no new weapons. But we still have to keep these uh, facilities going for the good of the country. Nigeria might be a threat in 30 years, and we might have to start rebuilding bombs or something like that. So we focus down in three areas. We think if we keep these uh, integrated capabilities and smart people and experienced people in these areas, we will be able to uh, meet the nation's defense needs in the future. Model-based design. Simulation modeling, obviously this leads you in your mind right away to virtual reality might be useful there. Rapid prototyping, the virtual part of that, virtual reality. Smart processes can be simulated in VR, and we'll get to that. But I'm a manager in manufacturing, and I came over from Bell Labs five years ago. I came across these guys at Sandia a couple, couple years after that who were interested in uh, making VR systems, and I was trying to figure out a way to get VR and manufacturing together. So at Bell Labs and AT&T, we had this product realization process. Uh, this is how we defined everything we did. You start off with a concept, you go to new requirements, R&D, test evaluation, all the way down to improvement and disposal. Some people call it lust to dust, or clean to grave. 
But you actually can manage this with a three-dimensional spiral because sometimes you recycle and you just keep redoing the same thing over and over. Some parts of this uh, lend themselves very well to virtualization in some part, either on a TV screen or a computer screen, in your mind or elsewhere. But when I found uh, the system called Muse, it's the multi-dimensional user-oriented synthetic environment system invented by some people at Sandia. I thought, you know, if we can adapt that to manufacturing, we can get good support for that project. So we use it now for virtual prototyping, we simulate testing, we do data fusion, and we do even some, uh, some testing. We bring in some supercomputer data to operate on the model. You'll see some of that in the film in just a second. So my idea was to virtualize everything. If you virtualize everything, you don't have to build any real parts. And computer time, no matter what it costs, is still cheaper than paying a lot of people to build parts, test them, maintain them, store them, have drawings, and all that kind of stuff. So when I made the pitch for virtualization, they kept asking, what's too many wires here? Uh, some people said, why do we need it? Everything we've done so far works real well. And I said, yeah, old drawings and blueprints used to work well until you got CAD systems, and you realized that uh, you really needed CAD systems. You didn't have CAD systems and computers when they designed the SR-71 Blackbird. They did a lot of slide rules, you know? But at some point, you realize you do need uh, to advance. In the future, as virtual reality becomes a desktop and becomes uh, something you get on your home cable, you will find needs for it. But more than likely, um, most people will still be conservative. You won't use it until you think you need it. However, it will be enabled by technology. Uh, technology, uh, is, as we all know, is speeding up every day. But it'll finally be the side of economics. Everything you've heard in this, um, all the talks from Bob Zubrin today to Bill Gobitz and people, Dave Andrews talking yesterday, cost is the bottom line. I'm doing a company on the outside, and believe me, the bottom line is the bottom line. If you can't decide about economics, it won't be decided for, uh, for the good of humanity. But all these are sliding scale as computational power innovation increase. Let me speed up here. Let's go down to virtualization. What do I mean by that? And why does it require new thinking? There's no use to go take something that's uh, fantastically uh, high tech like virtual reality and use it to do the same things that you did before in the lab bench or at home. Only do it in 3D space. Uh, for example, 70 years ago, people used to build models of molecules like balsa wood, tinker toy sticks, and things like that. That's great. Some people now like to use VR because they can put on the goggles and the glasses and a million dollar computer. And now it looks like the molecule model fills the room and they still take parts and move them around. You haven't learned anything. If you really want to take advantage of the new technology, what it enables you to do, you become a molecule. You put yourself on some kind of binding site or some atom. You drive this molecular chain behind you like a big semi air train. And then you go in space dock it with the rest of the molecule, that's what you're trying to do. You get inside of it, you think there are new capabilities, new capacities that didn't exist before. I think virtualization needs are going to predominate. And what do I mean by that? Well, like uh, Bob Zubrin said before, and talk right before this one, it only cost him $160,000 to do the study for Mars Direct. Now, what if they wanted to watch that in operation? Nobody's going to give them $10 million to go out and build a small model of it to test it on Earth. Not yet. He could spend $100,000 and make an entire virtual system, put in all the physical laws, all the dynamics, put in all the engineering drawings, and then let these people who have to make the decisions, like Dan Golden and others, uh, fly along with it, watch what happens, experiment with it, change things, watch it. So sometimes virtualization needs are going to predominate. And at some point, physical manifestations may have to be justified. Again, in engineering, uh, this already occurs. Some of the things I'm going to show you have not been built. It would be very expensive to build. The drawings already exist. We bring those up in 3D space. We play with them. We disassemble them. We assemble them. We change things. That's cheap. By comparison, if we had to spend a year and several hundred thousand dollars to build that part, we would just have one part. If we do it in virtual space, we have an infinite number we can play with. The last text, no, well, next to the last text. How much virtual, how much reality? 
this is a continuing argument in the engineering manufacturing field. The old guy said, you know, we built things for 20,000 years without ever having virtual reality. Why do we need it now? I said, well, you know, we got along with uh, without the germ theory of disease for most of humanity's life too, but that wasn't especially pleasant. I think hybrid reality is going to be uh, reality for the next uh, five or 10 years. Hybrid reality means that uh, you will build physical prototypes, you will build rocket engines, you will do this sort of thing. But at the same time, simulations of modeling get better and better and better and more realistic and you can put more faith in those. What I call enhanced reality is going to come along very soon. And uh, things will not be considered real if you don't have the virtual aspects with them. Let me give you a case in point. Uh, in five years or less, there will be uh, factory planning modules and software. The net already has them. You put all the machines online in your factory, you put them together, you turn on your virtual factory and watch it work. Okay, say you want to, you're a salesperson, you want to sell your new piece of robotics to this factory. If you can't supply a virtual version of it first, they're not, they're not going to buy it. They, you can say, well, here's, here's my physical model. They said, yeah, but I don't want to break it. I want to exercise all the parameters. I want to play with it. I want to take it, your software, pop it in my virtual world, and watch it work. If you don't have that, they're going to say, get real. And what they mean is, give us data that shows all the parameters, how it fits into everything else. That already happens today if any of you who are electrical engineers know that you will not order an integrated circuit without any data and then play with it by itself to see what happens. No, you design it and you order it based on the specs and virtual, uh, virtual part of the reality. This last bullet is a whole other talk by itself. People who say they see this as emerging paradigm shift don't know what they're talking about. If I ever say it, repeat that back to me. Because uh, the real paradigm shifts don't occur except in retrospect. Indulge me the science fiction part of this. This actually was part of a virtual manufacturing talk I gave in Albuquerque a few weeks ago. I've got some interesting questions about this, but I think simulation VR will be the norm. You won't call it that anymore. It'll just be called displays or some other term we haven't invented yet. In five years to 10 years, you'll have desktop immersive VR. The interface device, at, at worst for us, will be a pair of glasses or a pair of contacts or something similar that you pop on with peripheral vision, three dimensions, and you will be immersed in your data to the extent that you wish. It'll be a matter of choice, convenience, and appropriateness. If you're out jogging with your um, belt-worn Pentium processor with your glasses on, more than likely you would like to be warned if you're gonna run into a, a building or a car or vice versa. More than likely, you would not choose to be totally immersed in a crazy cat or Beavis and Butthead cartoon as you're doing that, although you might. If you're doing the latter, please. On the other hand, you might be able to transform reality so that if something appears as a threat to you in a cartoon or a generated world that you're in, it corresponds to something real that stops immediately and warns you, watch out, you're going to get run over. Interface equipment will be unobtrusive. Right now, we, there are helmets and gloves. We don't use any of that, although we could stand in. If you've ever played with VR helmets, they're crude and stupid. You look funny. I got a call one day while I was using some of these. And so I had this helmet on, and I got a cellular telephone stuck up under it. And a, a room full of people, if I had this many, they started laughing at me. I'm in the other world, I don't know what's going on. And then they, later they showed me what it looked like on the video. And things. That's stupid. They're heavy and they're crude. Boom is a binocular optical orientation module. It's like an old stereopticon. We have a video of it. You pull up to your eyes, you get a left and right image. As you move your head, uh, optical encoders in the uh, joints of this mechanical contraption keep track of where you're looking. The computer draws new images as if you're there. So no matter where you look, you get a new image in real time, in three dimensions. That's crude, and Bank Space Company makes it right now. They're a leading uh, interface system, but they're crude, and they'll be gone in five years or less. What we use in our lab is a boom for one person to control the system, and we project it on an 8 by 12 foot projection television screen, larger than what you're going to see today. If the computer generates a left image, and your glasses that you're wearing block out your right eye, computer draws the right image, computer glasses block out the left eye. They're synchronized.
So you get four three dimensions. When the solar system's up on the wall, I'm going to show you, it feels like you can fall into it. Laser eye glasses, contact lenses, that's going to be new technology. Magic wands, neural interfaces, all these things are thrown out to think about ways of interfacing with a new world. Jewels of technology. I think that uh, as computer computational power increases, and there, we will have a neural interface directly between us and the World Wide Web, which will be totally merged into three dimensional, uh, multi dimensional. And I have the last line there one more ring to bind them all or rule them all. I imagine that eventually the interface will be something like a ring. You're not, you know, it's a talking concept, and for that, Wagner, the old Germans, and lots of people had magic wands and magic rings. You put it on, most human beings, uh, with all their body parts at least, have at least 20 places you can wear these things, with, unobtrusively for the most part. And we all wear rings of some sort now, and we're likely to have This would uh, be, allow you to either to download new changes to your technology, or take it off if you wish. Wear it unobtrusively, no problem. I don't think there are ever going to be surgical implants that you're going to change. When the technology is changing hour to hour, an hour to now you can buy a system twice as good as you just had to put in. I don't think you're going to be operated on that many times. Something like a ring will do it. If you want to follow the manifestations of that in society, did a novella for Amazing Stories two years ago called Other Heads. It tells one of the effects that might occur when you can access all of human knowledge by one ring on your hand. All right, let's get into the front part. It's not the nicest we have, but it kind of illustrates what you're going to see. When you're in a new world of any kind, you want to be able to explore, to navigate, to examine. And so in this system, the multidimensional, the user-oriented synthetic environment views, we allow you to uh, First, present the data, presentation, uh, examination, I'm sorry, presentation, exploration, navigation, manipulation, and then comes uh, examination. You have to do all those things in a new world. It's almost a metaphor for um, physical existence, but here you have an entirely new universe that you've created you want to, uh, you want to interface with. What we give you here, I should have wrote the pointer, these white lines are the outlines of a transparent virtual craft that surrounds you at approximately chest height. Uh, as you can see here, there's a little pointer going out there like a little ornament that shows you where you're going. You can also use it as a manipulation tool. If you have, this, if you have defined your data sets properly, you can hook on with a force command called tether. You can hook onto that and move it around. So it lets you manipulate. Examination, this has all the uh, features of uh, GL and OpenGL means that you can go inside, you can slice things, you can change scale, you can play around, you can look at things from inside out, you can stay right in the middle of the wall. The other paradigm here is that uh, this is a traveling mobile office. It has walls. On the right wall here, we have a screen, a data screen. Right now it shows an older version of HBOM, but B61. And these are actual uh, engineering drawings, by the way. The colors just identify different data sets for operator convenience. On this wall, though, this could be real-time video, this could be faxes, email, the web page, anything else you want for all at once. And we'll show you something here, and the shoemaker let the impact data. We'll show video and uh, real-time, I mean, recorded video. On the left wall, for navigation, there's a mall map that tells you where you are at all points. There are speedometers and chronometers and headlights and everything else on, this, on the left wall, and you can add all kinds of instruments. The green thing here at the bottom is down. That's gravity that shows you which way down is. It's an infinite plane. Any of these features or all of them can be called all at once by voice command. They can be terminated by voice command. On the top here, you just see the, the back part of the B61 up close. It's kind of distorted from the angle it's at. These were printed right off of the computer. The films are going to take is going to show you everything was done in real time and recorded right off of the data stream or else the screen. Uh, there's no post-processing here, no Jurassic Park magic. It takes months of a credit computer to generate. Everything you see was generated in real time. With that, somebody can help me get this projection thing started. We will show you what it looks like. Just 
just a few minutes of this one, and then I want to go to the solar system. This first one is an engineering project. What about these guys? What about these scientists, these computer scientists? They were in danger of being defunded and laid off. I said, if we can make this um, applied to manufacturing, we can get it funded. Uh, we set them up in a real nice lab. The first visitor was the president of the San Diego Corporation. We've since uh, shown that SIGGRAPH and at the invitation of the White House, we took it to Washington last September. They came over to a hotel and watched it. Uh, the president's science office, uh, Gore, was in Cairo. And I don't know where the president was. Okay, this right here is data fusion. As it says, we have, uh, I think, five different data sets that were generated on other platforms. They're, they do not inter interact with each other. The guys tweaked a little bit. We're able to fuse all these data sets together. It's too bad you can't hear it. The guy right here with the ponytail is the uh, guy with the code. The guy in the striped shirt is Dr. Creed Maples. He uh, had the concept. The guy on the is a customer we got who paid for this work internally at Sandia. This is a, a CAD drawing of, a, of an integrated circuit that's only about three inches long. It's got uh, ASICs in the middle, there's an application to set integrated circuits, and some uh, FETs around the corner. Without getting into the details exactly what it does, all of the red parts you see there, you can go to, you can point to those. When you give a voice command and say, begin time, that will allow you then to uh, access the simulation at that point. This is not recording data or anything. So you access the simulation and it generates the output for you. On the left you see the uh, traveling instrumentation with you. Hmm. It's the first time I've heard it, or not heard it, one of these things, so it's kind of difficult to interact with. But anyhow, you go up and touch any of these pins that have little nodules on it, turn time on, and you get the output, the electrical output at that time. You go back on the surface here, touch any of those, and that accesses the thermal simulation. Okay, they're getting ready to do that here now. Okay, on the right-hand wall, when they begin time, which is a voice command, the computer will come back and say, okay, talks to you. You'll get the uh, circuit simulation output. We do the same thing for thermal. What you're seeing now, you have a, a CAD system. There's a finite element system overlaid on it. You're now seeing electrical output from it in virtual space. Yes. We can access the thermal analysis. We output the uh, temperature fields as sound. We output them as uh, colored isotherms, which are uh, colored waves that travel across it. People were actually able to play with the different simulations and uh, find out that they needed to change the substrate material for some heat transfer problems. Because as the things heat up too much, parts of it die, so they went back and changed it so that the heat's conducted different ways. I'll tell you, let's stop this because this is boring. Let's get to the solar system. This is a space conference, and I want to show space. We are going to send one of these following tapes to Dan Gold, and I saw him last week, the week before last. He was interested in the system and asked to see the tape, and I didn't have one with him. We have about, this other one's about 15 minutes. So I'll have to narrate it since we don't have any sound, and it's too bad. The craft, as you go, if you wish, the craft has engine noise. Sometimes it's aggravating, but after a few minutes, you don't even listen to it anymore. The paradigm is if you're driving your automobile. When you're driving your automobile, you're receiving all kinds of visual inputs, but you're also receiving vibrations through the seat and through your feet and the steering wheel. Whoops, okay. ready to start if you tell me one. Oh, okay, here we go. This is a Thunderbird. When you're driving an automobile, you're receiving um, multitudes of parallel channels of senses. Vibration, temperature, many visual and audio cues that you get. You could be driving a car, you could be smelling last night's pizza in the back seat, you could be rolling down the window to try to get the heat transferred so it gets the smell out. You, you get too cold, you turn on the heater, you're talking to the spouse or kids on the side, all at the same time. 
when you deal with a computer, typically all you do is get window after window after window on the screen and you get overloaded real quick. One of the goals here of the whole system from use is to access all those parallel channels at the same time. We will give you audio output, we will give you video output, we will give you color output, we can hook it up to a vibrating chair if you wish. What we like to say, and it's probably not totally true, that almost anything that can be digitized, we can bring up in three multi-dimensional space and present it for you in useful form. We can use it to drive any kind of outputs that can be driven digitally. What I'm saying right now is that Muse can have inputs from a mouse. This right here is the boot now he's looking to here. We have a, uh, a keyboard, I uh, have a joystick, but we can use a mouse, a keyboard, you can use anything to drive it, or you can do it over voice command if you wish. But sometimes when you're, uh, imagine you're driving your car, how would you like to have to reach over and grab a mouse and get a pull down menu to make a left turn. I mean, you do a context switch, you'd be very, very inefficient. And I get angrier and angrier knowing that this right here exists and I don't have it at home yet, but I'm working on it. Okay, here we're out beyond the solar system. Let's get into this. System. Here's your craft. I didn't watch the whole thing before I left because it's in such a hurry. I didn't want to repeat what I did at Winnipeg last year, which was promise people a solar system and not be able to find the tape and add it on. Okay, I think we're not so far beyond the solar system that here you can't even see the sun. Oops, okay, we're pointing at Jupiter. I don't know if Jupiter, I can see the bands from here. It's really not as good as it is when we have it in three dimensions. Okay, you can call up. Okay, here's the craft on the left. It's outside the data set, but it's pointed at something in the middle. There are speedometers. There, you see a chronometer going around there. Every time that the uh, little chronometer goes around, it dings once. You're going, that's one light speed. So fortunately, in the virtual world, virtual world, we do not have to pay attention to Einstein. All that we can, we can program it in if you want. So we're moving a multiple light speed through the Jupiter system. We can call it orbits. What, what they have here, the model of the solar system that's got 73 moving objects in it. This is generated dynamically from a, uh, another computer they have there. This is not stored data that you're going and looking at like you're looking at a picture. This is generated for you in real time. Everything you see here is in real time. There's a command called tether, if you wish. You can say tether, it will look to the nearest object. You can turn time on, you can go around with it. So if you want to grab over one of the Jovian moons and take a ride, it would be as if you were there. You can call up the orbits or have the orbits go away. And all this was hand coded just by numbers and then we have a summer soon to come in and lay some texture mapping on the uh, orbs to make the planets look realistic. Okay, when you call up plane, it makes you like a space plane or an airplane. That means you can travel any angles. Most of the time, without playing, you're right, or a hovercraft. That means you translate horizontally, up and down, on the rectangular. Here we go. Here's Jupiter. It loses a lot of that to sound. It's going to say you have engine noise. That's an algorithm of uh, instantaneous velocity acceleration. So you get a feel for how fast you're going. The white lines are orbits here. Let's see. So close there. These lines here? Okay, you missed that part. This is a, you're able to start and stop time here, backing up. All the white lines there, let's say the square white lines are instruments on the left, uh, left wall. Let's see what you're seeing. Okay, the orbits get kind of distorted here for other planets. Okay, here are the moons. You can call up, when you see this flashing light on the side, that tells you you have improper scale. But the moons are so small that if the scale were out, you would not be able to see the smaller moons of Jupiter. So we call it uh, display objects, and that gives them a minimum size. 
obviously they're not all that big, some of them are just you know, a few kilometers in diameter. So you get rid of the orbits here, so the rest of the orbits, so now you just see the uh, Jupiter and its moon itself. Okay, now they went back to a true scale. You can see a few of them, but you can't see most of them. Like I said, in your imagination now, imagine this is much more clear. You're hearing all the sounds of the craft and another narrator. They're calling the star field here in the background. It's probably not visible from out there. But you call it the star field, the real stars. And um, here we go. On the right-hand wall is once you access a planet, you can call it the data. This is a NASA photograph of that. At the same time, if you wish, you could also have all the planet's parameters there or any other information coming at the same time on the same wall. Now we use this, um, typically I don't show the solar system because this is, doesn't apply to most business applications. Here we go, here's some, some video on that same wall of um, one of the flybys. Not the most impressive, but this shows we can call it live or video at the same time, motion, motion pictures. Typically what I show when you do a demo like this, we show a CAT scan, MRI scan of the human brain. We show um, seismic data in this abstract so that financial people can say we can plot financial data this way. We show the CAT system. We show uh, Supercomputer models of explosive welding. We show time-dependent models. This is probably the first time this one's been shown any place on the outside. Okay, here are all the orbits have been called back up again, so you can see where you are. The next thing we're going to do is take, I think right after this, if I remember my scanning tape right, we're going to jump to the Earth. Then we're going to do a logarithmic, trans logarithmic transformation of the solar system. I'll tell you, the first time I played this two years ago, I got inside and played with it for about an hour. And as far as my body was concerned, it's real. I dream about it, yet. To me, in three dimensions, it felt like I was actually there. And at a gut level, which is what they want to do, they want to educate and train you at a gut level. I actually believe it, and I still dream about it. And that's kind of nice. One of the problems, of course, is if you start teaching people this way and give them false models and false impressions, they're going to learn it subconsciously at a gut level. And it's going to be hard to overcome. You heard how speeches and videotapes and movies can influence people. I imagine if you can start learning these things so literally. The next step we're going to do is do a logarithmic transformation of the solar system to show all the planets at one time according to a, uh, an algorithm that guys worked out. Yeah, that's the orbit of the Earth. Oh, those were other orbits. Uh, there was the moon's orbit was back there, and you can see the orbit, so all the other planets too. What they can do, of course, is get rid of the craft, get rid of all the lines, and you're going to start to see it just like it is in space. Uh, we showed it in various NASA places, and they wanted one. Uh, in the back, there are handouts about this, and I have some colored handouts. If you'll see me after this is over, outside, I'll give them to you. What happened was we started showing this around for a year or so, and every place I showed it, somebody wanted to buy one. And we had so many requests to do that that I got together with these fellows, and we are doing a startup company called Vega Technologies Corporation, and we are going to commercialize this thing. Um, I have the business plan in my room right now to review it. In fact, we're we're going out for investment, but we have a lot of large corporations that would like to buy it and use it as is. And we hope to have uh, shrink wrap packages to sell in another year or so that uh, anybody can have a, maybe Muse Light or Micro Muse or something like that. Probably not the whole thing. It takes right now a Skywriter or an Onyx to generate the graphics. Because, well, we can do it on we can do it on Mac or PC right now, but if you got an image out every 30 seconds, you probably wouldn't like it and think that was real virtual reality. Here we go. Logarithmic transform of the solar system, showing all the orbits. We all played around inside this thing so long, it was very frustrating to realize how large the solar system is and the fact that you can't tell where the planets are, they look like stars in real life. So what if you could shrink it all up together? So Creed came up with this model, cascading you know, logarithms, I think he called it. 
sizes and relative positions of all the planets and moons are approximately right. This is being calculated in real time. Here, I think you have Uranus here. It's perpendicular to the ecliptic. You have all the different moons. So what you can do now is pick out one, tap it to one of those, and take a ride along with it. So they're going over here to, uh, let's see, we're going to stop, uh, Neptune. They're going to stop and grab a hold of one of the rotating moons, and we'll take a wild ride through the solar system here. Again, when you're doing this in 3D, it really has almost a literal gut reaction. My God. This is actually the, uh, the debugging program. Every time a new feature is introduced, they put it in here first and play with it before they take it out to mundane things like integrated circuits and gears and bombs and stuff like that. Very shortly, they're going to get rid of all the orbits, get rid of the craft, get rid of the gravity plane, everything. And all you're going to see are the orbs themselves in motion. And I bought them a projection TV last year, and they asked me to bring this up, they did. And it was like I was standing there holding the entire solar system in my hands. And as I told Mary Ann last night, I think that was the closest thing to a religious experience I've ever had in the laboratory. Uh, it's all right there, it's in my hand. Sometimes, not to be blasphemous, we call this a God's eye view of the solar system because only God or some other multi-dimensional creature could see all the solar system at once. If you go far enough out like we were at the beginning of the tape, you can't see the whole solar system because this. things get too small. Here we go. They're going to look on this moon and they're going to start time. Okay, this must be Uranus. What's that orange dot? Uh, there's another moon someplace. Here we go. Oh, yeah, laser pointer. You're right. Okay, here we go. We're we tethered to this moon, the innermost moon of Uranus, I guess. Now, if you wanted to, we could get, I don't know if they do it or not, we could get right on top of it and sit on top of it and see what all these other orbits look like and get sort of crazy. Now, this, you know, these could be uh, molecular interactions, this could be financial data, this could be somebody's database. Fill in the blanks. And what we're going to do first depends on which of these large corporate customers comes through with the money to do for them. But uh, we'll be operational this summer with Vega Technologies. To make the, well, in virtual reality, since the laws of physics don't apply, you write your own laws and you do your own thing, literally. Uh, when they first did this, they were surprised at the output there. Nobody had ever seen a larger main solar system before. Now let's get rid of the craft. So you can imagine standing there right in front of it with your hands up like that. And it looks like it's projected on the screen right in your hands. And, uh, it's too bad you're going to miss the theme music here because we took it. And this has never been done in all of human history. This, this go around at least. No way it's ever done. That's probably a good enough tagline. I think we're out of time. And uh, I don't think we have time for the Shoemaker level thing, do we? We got 10 minutes? Okay. Let's let it roll then. Mark Boslow and another fellow physicist at uh, Sandia calculated what the uh, shoemaker levy impact was going to be. They ran it on the world's fastest computer, which we have, using our CTH code. Here we go. Mark Boslow and David Crawford. These are Sandia guys who were the only people, only astronomers, to predict that you would be able to see the impacts on the other side of uh, Jupiter. Carolyn and Gene Shoemaker came uh, to see it after the impact. It's not as Hollywoodish as the other stuff. What we have here, this is about 30 seconds after one of the fragments is smashed into the upper atmosphere of Jupiter. And there's a blowback. When it hit, it blew out a bunch of stuff out the other way. I think we have 400 individual components that the computer keeps kept track of. 
Now what we did here in this case, the Paragon computer ran for hours or days to generate this information. We bring it all up and show it uh, at any speed we wish. These individual elements that were part of the CTH code, and there are several papers will be written on this. They did have what the entire thing looked like as a wave front, and I played with that last year. It looked to me like a cosmic hurl. I mean, it looked like somebody just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Somebody say, well, what, if you got hit by something three kilometers diameter, 40,000 kilometers a second, or whatever, you'd probably hurl too. Yeah, kind of point. The point is, in this case, these guys had already done all this in two dimensions. There's three dimensional, multi dimensional data. They had done it, and watch it only on a screen. Yeah, you're right there. So laser pointer he uses to talk about it. They learned a lot uh, by the model. First off, the model predict, successfully predicted that you'd be able to see the fireball on the other side of Jupiter, which we all did see. The Paragon model showed it almost exactly the way it turned out to look like. So these guys were really happy about that. Then they were wondering about the detail of it. They brought it into the Muse lab. They were able to fly around inside of it, look at data from different angles, play with it, stop time, start time, back it up, teleport different times and spaces. When you're in a time-dependent model, you can mark a time verbally, and then ask to be teleported, returned to time, whatever, later on. If you're zooming around on any kind of model or any kind of simulation, any kind of rendering, and you see something you like, you say, mark position one, two, whatever, up to hundreds, and it has to be teleported back to there. So as you're cruising around this new, new world, you're able to put up little markers in time and space or other dimensions say return to temperature such and such or vibration so and so and you can pop back in there and uh, it takes you right back to it it's also possible since all this is happening in real time essentially you can uh, pre-plan a trajectory you can pick out something you really did like like we zoomed through the hills and arroyos around albuquerque and one of these that was really neat record all that you can play it back anytime here's some more of the blowback all this stuff is Come, had come in and, and blown back, and they were able to calculate what the constituent um, elements were in this, based on that. Again, on uh, um, atomic level scale, this could be some uh, huge molecule. You know, this could be this could be DNA or an age virus or something like that. If you have the model, the simulation, our VR shell, Muse, we'll wrap around it, and we can bring it up in multi-dimensional space for you. On the back um, table there, there are a lot of handouts. One of them talks about this, and uh, there are a lot of Sandia manufacturing handouts, which are part of the commercial that I always have to go through. All right, at this point, are there questions? I know we're, we might have to watch it, but we must be running out of time. Somebody over here. Yeah. Um, a lot of It's going to happen. Uh, part of the text you asked when I give the other talk, I spend about 20 minutes on that. I think it will be regulated. I have heard unofficially, don't quote me, even though I'm going to be on videotape. I have heard unofficially that at least one large Japanese game manufacturer did some trials in this country and found that uh, some kids who are playing a particularly violent game uh, took that behavior out into the real world afterwards. I would not be surprised to have regulation that requires a certain level of maturity or age to enter in certain virtual worlds. It may be decompression time before you're allowed out. <laughs> Think about that. In other words, uh, there might be a way you go in and you can play Doom and Mortal Kombat and all this neat stuff and blood and guts and everything. But we don't need any more McVeigh's in the world. So as a, even as an adult, you might be required to go through a compression time. Okay, a trailer comes up before you're allowed to turn it off and it shows you peaceful scenes this wasn't real. I'll do this in real life. <laughs> it could happen. The danger is going to be if uh, Nazis, communists, or pick your own favorite worst group, get their kids at a young age and voluntarily give them this stuff. I didn't know about it. I was talking to an NSS group in Albuquerque about all the wonderful things you're learning at a gut level. You know, just experience it, therefore you know it without having to be told. Like I said, but what if the Ku Klux Klan had that? Dummy, I never thought of that question. Yes, I never thought of it.
you could totally brainwash them and they would have experienced it. And it, it's going to be almost impossible to undo that. So Clockwork Orange is right around the corner if we're not careful. Questions? If you want to see me after, I do have some color handouts. I guess I guess I didn't put them in the back table. They're all there. So if you want to stop by and pick up some stuff, please take it home because I don't want to have to lug it back to New Mexico. Thank you.